Hello and welcome back to Cardinal Television. I'm Steve Brower, Associate Professor of English here at St. John Fisher, and I'm joined today by, uh, with, with Stephen Belber, um, a playwright, uh, screenwriter, and uh, television writer. Um, Steve, you've, you've had a, a, a terrific career. Um, you've, you've done a lot of different work in different medium, obviously. Um, just to let our audience know, um, you, you were a member of Tectonic Theater Project, in which you were one of the co-writers of the Laramie Project. Um, You've written a number of plays that have been produced in New York, around the country, and even around the world, and those include Match, um, Small Melodramatic Story, McReel, uh, Dusk Rings a Bell, and we can, we can mention mm -hmm. a lot, Through Fred, one mm -hmm. of my <laughs> throwback. Um, and uh, in terms of uh, tape was made into a uh, film directed by Richard Linklater, starring Ethan Hawke uh, and Uma Thurman, um, Match, you, you end up writing the screenplay and directed with Patrick Stewart. Um, you, ended, uh, you, you wrote the screenplay and directed Management with Jennifer Aniston. Um, you've got some more work coming out. We'll, we'll talk about that uh, in terms of television. You've written for Rescue Me. You've written for Law and Order. Um, so you've had a, a varied career, and we, we were, in, were uh, interested in having our audience hear a little more mm -hmm. about what, what that has meant. Um, I thought maybe we could start sort of near the be at the beginning. What what got you interested in doing this type of work, uh, and and where did it begin, and and, and how did it proceed in the early years? Um, I had acted in high school, so I was always had a bit of a theater bug. But then as I got into college, I, I thought I was going to try and be a novelist, and I, mm -hmm. I was working on novels. And then at some point, soon after college, I realized uh, I wanted to combine those two uh, loves, and uh, sort of, and I started writing these very prosaic. Uh, prose-oriented one-person shows uh, that I thought was incorporating my undergraduate philosophy degree <laughs> and infusing that in there. They were. They were. Um, so I was like, oh, I get it all together. And, and so I, I, I moved back to Washington, D.C., where I'd grown up, and I was working as a journalist mm -hmm. by day, and at night I was doing these one-person shows at small little places. Uh, after three or four years, I, I decided to give it a whirl in New York, and I moved up there. And started taking playwriting classes and trying to understand that craft through the sure. through through one acts really. And, and then once you get confident with one acts, I finally wrote my first full length. Um, I twice applied to a, a new program that was in town called uh, that Juilliard was running. Juilliard, sure. known for its acting, had uh, w wanted to bring in contemporary writers so that their actors were not just studying Shakespeare. Right. And uh, so I, I eventually I didn't get in there with my one person show, but when I did write a, a full length play, I applied, got in, and. Um, and that was the first time I could, you could really sort of take yourself a little more seriously as a writer, almost call yourself a writer for the first time right. rather than a, a waiter. I was still waiting, but they give you health insurance. They gave me a stipend, and I was able to work part-time and spend a lot more time. It's almost like an apprentice program in a way. It was great because right? yeah. you have access to the actors. Yeah. You have uh, uh, workshops once a week with, uh, you know, and it's only four, four playwrights who get in a year. Mm -hmm. So it's a very tight and... It's like a company. Two mentors, yeah. yeah. Um, so that... I, that uh, was, was good for me. I kind of came out of there uh, both excited to keep writing, but also um, a little bit chasing uh, what it took, I thought it took to get an agent and trying to, mm -hmm. to, to write plays that t were tailored to the marketplace as opposed to whatever original voice I might have had going in with my little quirky one acts. And uh, that took me a while to sort of get back to my, uh, the original impulse and not try to please the, the, the theaters, the off-Broadway theaters or the agents that you wanted to sign. With um, so that took a while, and it, it was finally when I, um, I wrote this play, Tape, which was a, a, a sort of a short play inspired by some friends of mine who wanted me to write for them. That I wasn't trying to reinvent the wheel; I just wanted to write something kind of true and honest that I knew about, and that got me. Um, we did that off off Broadway, and it was right. fun to sort of put it up. But I eventually got that to an agent in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. I had, by that time, I had a. A theater agent, but I but I got it to Los, and that got me a Law and Order job, and so that right. got me a foot in the door there, because it was um, it was quick repartee and patter, and it allowed me to sort of uh, show that I was good at dialogue, which mm -hmm. was sure. Hollywood's not known for. They they do you know there's just more. This, I didn't know how to write a full screenplay. I knew how to sure. just do that, and that was a, a tool they wanted. Um, and at the same time, uh, I was I started working with Tectonic Theater Project, right. and. Um, because I was a journalist, I sort of talked my way into this trip they were going to take to Laramie to sort of do interviews based on the death of Matthew Shepard in right. 1998. And that um, was a big life changer for me personally, just because it um, gave me access to uh, 
a type of storytelling uh, that was very research-based and docudrama-esque mm -hmm. that allowed me to, um, uh, I think, really pursue the angles of a story that I was interested in. Uh, sure. Some of it was social justice, some of it was how people are formed and become who they are. It's a sprawling and, work, Laramie. Yeah, it's, it really it's a mosaic of a yeah. community. And I liked that journalistically. I was sort of trained to do that a little mm -hmm. bit. And, um, and yet you could, you could shape the narrative as you, uh, because we were including ourselves in that story. We were not saying, oh, we're right. objective journalists. We're, we were going to show our subjectivity. And, uh, and so it's sort right. of. Your so character can, in the play, yeah. for those who haven't seen it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and we're very clear and open about the idea like, oh, we are selectively showing you the parts that interest us. This is not, you know, and this is why we're theater people interested in this story out here in the, in the West, mm -hmm. you know, in this small town. And we were open and trying to include that in the presentation of the work, that this is biased inherently. So these, the tape and, and Laramie are, are really con almost concurrent. Yeah. At, the, in, it, at that point in your career, you finished with Juilliard. You, you've gotten to know some people in the New York theater world, both somewhat uptown, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. uh, sort of Lincoln center -y. Yeah. And then down in the, in the, and I know you were doing a lot of downtown work as well. Absolutely. Right, and so that's sometimes a little more experimental, <laughs> whether if you're one act or, um, other types of fun, you know, almost a like more multimedia yep. um, stuff going on. And so I hear you trying to figure out how to negotiate these things and then having these two projects that just clicked right for you. Yeah, absolutely right, because I was doing downtown stuff and, and some of it was really bizarre and I was in different theater companies down there. I saw you dance. Yes, you saw me <laughs> dance and I was finding myself as an artist. <laughs> and, uh, and it took a while, and, but it's true, Laramie sort of congealed something which was devised theater, what later became known as devised theater, where you're working in a group dynamic, yeah. you're discovering the piece in the room rather mm -hmm. than a writer going off and writing. And, and literally between trips to Laramie and workshops where we were devising, I, I sat down and wrote this play, which I sort of was, again, for me to sort of, because I didn't want to let go of the idea of the writer going off to, ha to create his or her own vision mm -hmm. on paper. I still like that. And I was probably a little sick of the collaboration at that point and needed to carve <laughs> yeah, that time out. Yeah, your own thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so it was nice to have, uh, to have those things sort of um, hit at the same time. And, and, and uh, it allowed me to, and they were related because they were about listening. I, I, in mm -hmm. Laramie, I really learned how to listen, I feel like, as yeah. an interviewer. I, I to not interrupt, to let the people yeah. reveal themselves and their stories to you. And tape has to, an element of that. It's literally sure. a guy with a tape recorder hiding and trying to get a story from his friend. Right. Um, so I was, uh, it was nice to, 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 to have those rise. And I, I was like, if one of these things can get me you know, to the next level, that would be great. And, right. and, um, well, that's certainly, I mean, that, I, I'm not sure people always understand what it means to be a writer in terms of the labor of it, mm. right? In terms of the, what it means to sort of the, the dailiness of not just the, the craft of writing, which of course part of what you do, but then, you know, we used to talk about part of your job as a writer in New York as a playwright is to see every play yeah. and to and to talk to the people who've made the plays and to go to those parties and and the the labor of it um, in terms of getting something done finding the right project uh, you talked about how tape got you this ultimately to law and order mm -hmm. um, and probably that changed your you know, these things kind of change your financial security can you sure. talk a little bit about those realities of what it means to be sort of a, a, a young writer living in a expensive I mean, I, city. <laughs> I think that, the, it, you know, I had, one has two choices in some ways. You go to LA and you try to crack into the business there, mm -hmm. or you do theater, which is no guarantee uh, that, that that's going to, to you know, to, to convey, to parlay itself out into to Los Angeles. But I was very glad that I did the self-starter work of theater, and, and people self-start with screenplays, but the notion that I wasn't expecting anything other than hoping to break into New York theater scene. Right. So I was willing to work the day job, and, and right. to, after Juilliard, I went back to work as a, actually a part-time journalist and a cater waiter still and all that stuff, but it allowed me to just work and to um, understand the notion that it's all speculative, mm -hmm. and as they, you know, spec scripts yeah. actually ended up helping me later because I knew how to write on my own without mm -hmm. waiting for someone to pay me or commission me or... Um, and that's what theater people do. And in I terms think, of like the work ethic, like you just come and absolutely. sit down and do it. Like I have this story, and I'm gonna, I'm just gonna do it. And honing the craft, like what yeah. you're asking. Like I, I, uh, I got a fair amount of instruction at Juilliard, mm -hmm. but it's mostly repetition. And 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 I, I think that if I hadn't developed my sense of dialogue and voice and whatever those things are that you do through pure repetition, I wouldn't have been as attractive a commodity later on as a, a, someone for hire. 
Um, right. So you can learn how to write a, a two-hander. You, 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 you learn what it's like to have two characters in the scene. Yeah. Uh, and then you learn what it's like to have three and four and five and how to manage characters as a storyteller, which is much different telling a five-person story than a two-person story. Very much. Let alone, you, start, you talk about, I began with one. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. One is, and, and that's, one is good in a way because it starts you just, you're telling a story. Right. It's literally a monologue. And, but then New York is also just floating with out of work actors <laughs> that you invite to your apartment and you hear it. And when you hear it, it's painful often the first time until you, right. you start to figure out what works and what doesn't work. And that's a fun process to go through. And again, no one was watching, no one cared. Right. So I was okay. You were all young and out of work. <laughs> yeah, and you're willing to, to go for it, you know, and right. you're not, chasing again chasing the goal and I, and I was a little bit when I got out of Juilliard but that was a I wasn't trying to write screenplays for that we're going to sell for a million dollars so okay. I, you know and I think that's one path people take and sometimes I think oh if I had done that I might have been farther along in my Hollywood career right but I, I don't think I would be as good a writer actually yeah um, uh, so it took a while and, and I think when I was able to eventually quit the day job it was a lucky because Laramie we were touring that production I was able sure. to get uh, you know, equity and, and, yeah. and, and be an well actor. Known. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, the, the law and order thing. Tape had sort of hit a little bit. Got me there, yeah. yeah. Um, and so that was, uh, that was fun to be able to sort of tentatively segue into full-time writing. Right. So let me just take a, a quick break to talk a little more about then about the craft. Mm -hmm. So um, I know you've talked about um, when you're writing, especially if you're writing like, let's say, three or four characters, um, what you're, tr you know, when you're writing one, you're, as you said, you're telling stories. Sometimes you're performing more than one character, but but characters aren't developed in the same way in a one-person show, generally speaking. Mm -hmm. There, um, you have to mm, find a shortcut to this is what communicates that I'm now this person. This yeah. is what communicates that whether it's a wig or a hat or yeah. an accent. Um, whereas when you're writing a play with with multiple people, you have to do a different thing with character and respecting that character and getting at their mm -hmm. reality. Can you talk a little bit about? how you learned how to do that, um, and, and what that developed into, and how that then helped you as you went down the line. I mean, it, it, it is as simple as, um, I think it started with one act, and I remember taking a class where we had to put up a one act every week, and we had a couple a director, a writer, a couple writer, a writer, and a couple actors, and we would, I would be the writer, and I would, and, and it's about um, learning to imbue your character with enough weird idiosyncratic stuff that then an actor can take it over and has enough to work with and create his or her own interpretation of that. And seeing that, seeing an actor take your words and enhance them and uh, inhabit them in a way that three-dimensionalizes that character is, is a huge thing for a writer to see for the first time. Of course, and it's Eric Bogosian and Sean Griziamo. It's these guys who were just these one-act forces, right? Yeah, and, that's and they were great, but they were, and they were funny, and they were, but, and they were putting on wigs, and they were doing mm -hmm. good at voices, but to literally hand it over, to go from that, yeah. which I was emulating, yeah. and, and the Spalding Gray, I want to throw in there, as, yes, a, as someone who is just a classic storyteller. Right. right. And, and he doesn't play characters. No, he just tells someone to Cambodia. Just, yeah, he just, <laughs> and it's... It's all him, and, and it's funny, because Leguizamo would um, literally costume up and become a different character. Bogosian would just sort of inhabit and go in and out of his own perso persona, yeah. and, and Spalding Gray would never left his own persona. Right. And I, I, I saw all those guys, and I was like, yeah. that's interesting, and what's my version of that? But it was most exciting to hand over the characters mm -hmm. that I was working on, probably subconsciously in my one-person shows, and hand them over to actual live living actors who right. can... Uh, open your eyes as to oh that's that's possible I couldn't have done that on myself right. <laughs> you know obviously right um, and that's why you know actors get a lot of flack understandably for me but they have such a tool that they're honing so deeply it's like an opera singer it's an instrument right. and when you when you give your your role to them that you've thought about you can only think about it so much you can mm -hmm. do research you can empathize you can but when you give it to them and they live it that's it's really exciting to watch as a writer. When they just settle into that moment yeah. and they just are. And they soar and I, yeah, yeah. with it a little bit. Yeah, you, where you can't see performance. Yeah. You just see the character. Yeah. yeah, and it's so different than what the voice in your head when you were writing it sounded right. like because it's suddenly a real voice. I would think that'd be both freeing and well, there's another, like, I mean, you must get frustrated sometimes. Like, no, that's not what I'm... <laughs> totally frustrating. Uh, yeah, I, I'm being generous. Because especially having done some acting myself, I wanted to always like, no, no, no this is how I... But I, I know, and it took me a while to learn that, as frustrating as that can be, when you do find someone who gets what you're going for rhythmically and uh, stylistically and soulfully, mm -hmm. like if you get if you find those actors, you hold on to them and let them t take it to the other level. And I remember 
one thing in Dusk Rings a Bell was an off-Broadway sure. play of mine. And, Kate, and Wal Kate Walsh. Right? Kate Walsh and, and this guy Grace Paul Sparks. Anatomy. Yeah, yeah. yeah she was, and she was lovely. She's a stage trained actor, so mm -hmm. I, I trusted her right away and she was a, yeah, she a was great. work ethic. Yeah, she was great. Great job. And this other guy, Paul Sparks, who is sort of a cool, cool New York actor, very, mm -hmm. you know, and he's on TV now, and he's, but he is a real mumbler, and I like underacting, and I like mumbling, but I remember wanting to fire him up until like I can't hear you. You know, I'm in the third row. <laughs> yeah, can't hear you, and I can't understand. You're not, you're not actually going through the emotional things, but he was. It was just so buried deep, and realizing when the moment he got in front of an audience, and granted, he he jacked up his performance a little bit once the audience was sure. there, but also watching the audience watch him and seeing that he is having these emotional experiences and you don't need to act them out overtly and he wasn't and the audience actually leans in to get his performance mm -hmm. and it's something I hadn't conceived of for that particular role in that case and it was another moment of education for me of like oh he's thinking of stuff you weren't thinking of he's right. experiencing emotions that you actually were cerebrally and only writing right and, right. and that's yeah, he's in valuable. it he's in yeah, it you were writing it but somehow he's and the audience it. recognizes that and you didn't realize the audience was going to recognize that, right. and that's that's, that's you, powerful. Well, yeah, yeah. Uh, it can be, yeah. Yeah. So let's. Um, a lot of the work you've done is, uh, and we've talked about this before, and, and you you were talking about this sort of coming out of Juilliard and how you're trying to write and, and find your voice in your place. So let's talk a little bit about what it is you 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 want to write about, right? And and I've and I've told this story before that. We're, seeing a play with you and, and you coming out going, this is the type of work I want to do. And I think it was Drew from a Bridge, Arthur Miller, and saying, I want work that speaks to the world, that speaks to issues going on. And I want to be uh, a writer with, who makes an impact. I want, to have a, I want to have an impact on how the culture talks about things. Um, I don't want it only about me and my own. Mm -hmm. Neuroses. My neuroses. <laughs> I, I put the, your word, <laughs> not mine. Um, so, uh, yeah, or own just my own perspective on something, but I want to create characters that, that engage an audience in questions that should matter to us. Mm -hmm. So c can you talk a little bit about how your work has done that, um, and where it started, and how that has bled into different types of projects? Um, yeah, it's that That's fine line. That's a huge line. question, by the way. No, but it's a fine <laughs> line of wanting to write, you write from your gut and write from your personal gut, and it, so it has to be ha an element of person, personal attachment to the subject matter. Right but not navel gaze and mm -hmm. how, do you, uh, how do you get out and talk about the world while writing from a gut-fueled place. And um, I mean that play tape, for example, is a good yeah. example because it, it, you know, it's not an Arthur Miller play in the sense that it's not about the corruption of big um, industry American in America. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it is about a corrosive element within, within our world and within a particular type of young man in America, let's say. Mm -hmm. and, I'm, and because I'm a young man in America, when I wrote it, I was uh, identifying, I, I knew that world, I knew yeah. the pitfalls of it, and I knew the tangents that led to bad stuff, and I wanted to get at that, and I wanted to get at it through humor and through a way that made us, oh, oh we all know these guys, we yeah, all grew up yeah. with guys like this, and then to sort of flip that switch a little bit and get, get at a bigger uh, issue, which in this case was, you know, um, date rape, which was even... And like male privilege of a certain, male like, yeah. you know, of, of uh, an expectation where like, this is what happened, and, and I'm a guy, and these things happen. And that, that perspective, uh, I don't need to think of the female perspective on it even. Right. Even in retrospect, is if I feel sorry about it, I feel sorry, and regardless of what she may feel about it and how she wants to interact about it now. Right. Um, I mean, the, for those who haven't seen it, please do, and, and it's, it's available mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all over. So, yeah, um, and, and it's still produced, I'm sure, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, as, a, as a play, but also um, as, a, as, as the film. When Amy comes in, how she changes everything that's been going on in that room is, is truly a, a powerful moment um, when she just refuses to accept their notions of what this story is. Yeah, their entitlement of their, uh, of the, of their controlling of that narrative. Yeah. They feel like they, they, one guy gets the other guy to admit to something he did. He decides, I'm going to apologize. And she comes in and says, you can't have it that easy. It's only, you're only doing it because I'm here. It's convenient to right. you. And, and that seemed to, even ways I didn't even realize, it seemed to hit a chord of, of like, oh yeah, this is the epitome of male entitlement right. and, and domination of the, of the narrative. Right. And, um, it's forward looking, Steve. Well, it, it's, <laughs> it literally is one of those things you strike upon without realizing, and I knew that I had three actors and uh, two guys yeah. I could do, and I would bring her in, and I didn't, and, I, and, and the play used to end, this is getting wonky, but like the play used to end at a certain point, and I heard a reading of it, and I realized, oh, now it can actually really delve into this and really mess with 
their expectation. So I was messing with my own expectation of what I was writing, right. rather than planning it out and getting to an end, an end that I had already stated for mm -hmm. myself. Um, so how do how do you surprise yourself as a writer was something I learned, right. and 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 to sort of follow an instinct but not know where it's going was a good thing for for me. Right. So and, and we've talked about this before. You know, where does the writing start? And I think it, 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 I've heard you say it starts in different places. Some people begin with character. Mm -hmm. Some people begin with scene. Some people begin with an idea. I want to write a play about such and such. And at one point you're like, well, I want to write a play about th these ideas and issues. Mm -hmm. But one thing I'm also hearing you say is once you get into that, based on some of the projects you've been doing, mm -hmm. and start interacting with actors who then start reading it, is you don't, you, you're not only writing about the ideas and issues anymore, because now you're actually writing about the characters. Yeah, I mean, there's that f famous Irish book, I can't think of the name, uh, at Swim Two Birds, I don't yeah, know, yeah, yeah. Where, where the characters take over the narrative. Yeah. And you do want that, you want to give them and imbue them with such uh, individuality and, uh, and self-awareness that, that they should surprise you at a certain point. Right. And, and that's trick, cause you, tricky in that you want to guide an audience through a journey and you, ha you have an idea for what that journey should be. But the twists and turns of it should surprise you theoretically if you're doing your job well and empowering your characters. To, and that sounds a little corny and dumb, but it's it's true. Like if you write them with integrity, they will uh, mm -hmm. inform you as you go. Uh, and that was a case w where that really happened. And I can tell when work of mine works and doesn't work, and, and often has to do with that. With me over planning it, yeah, it, 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 the audience you know sees where, where it's going. Where you can't know where you're going to end up too quickly. Yeah. Yeah. And certainly not the actual circuitous nature of it should be a surprise. Right. So, so, the, so as a professor, this is a conversation I have with students all the time when they're, they'll say, like, what's, what's the meaning of the play and, or what's the lesson of the play? And I'll be like, listen, on one level, it means Steve got paid. Mm -hmm. it's, it's work. It's labor, right? Mm -hmm. and I, I'm trying to help my students understand that, that writing is labor mm -hmm. and that uh, there's, there's other ways to think about it than just sort of what they teach you in 10th grade. Mm -hmm. English class um, about Gatsby and the American Dream. Yeah. Um, yeah. But that uh, we've had lots of experiences where you've told me like how you hear from people in the audience at, at the end of a play, what the play was about, yeah. and what that's like as the person who wrote it and, and, and sort of the discipline of just letting them articulate it in their own words because at some point you have to give that up. Yeah, right? and it's joyous when they, when they do come in. I mean, sometimes it's harebrained, but like sometimes it's like, oh my God, I, I had no idea I had tapped into that. Right. And sometimes it's uh, their subjective take on it, but it's no less valid for that. Um, sure, yeah. yeah. As, as any art, that's what it means to experience art, Absolutely. Right? whether it's painting or... To not dictate, to let it be interpreted. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and that, that's of course always a challenge. The, the work is the work, and then I have to let go of it. The yeah. minute it's performed. Yeah. Right. Yeah, um, and that's a little different, probably, for theater and and film, where you can micromanage more in film. Absolutely, and, and, uh, you're literally sh showing them how to see. Yeah, exactly. Right. You're pointing the camera, and you're editing it down to every every split second. Right. Yeah. So let's keep talking about then about this sort of negotiation of writing and of, of of issues and ideas and character. As you moved coming out of, uh, we, t we sort of talked about Laramie and Tape as sort of these sort of breakthroughs for you that mm -hmm. got you to different audiences different agents, different, right? It, yeah, it sort yeah. of changed your career yeah. in, in some ways in, in, in television. How, you know, in the next 15 years or so, how have you negotiated that as a writer uh, in terms of moving your career forward, pursuing certain types of projects, whether the ones that are personal or again, like, yeah, but I want to write with impact, right? The, the, all this, mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little how that's? Um, yeah, I'm not sure I've always navigated it well. Um, I mean, for example, Law and Order. Yeah. I learned. I was learning a lot about structure, and that that's a very tightly structured yes. piece every week. So you really are compelled to adhere to this uh, structure. In, in preset characters. Yeah, <laughs> and if I had worked for them ten years later, longer, or five years, or two years, later, I would be a much wealthier person because that's a cash cow. A. Eh? Yeah, yeah. And um, but at a certain point, I realized I wanted to, to to pursue movies more, and I really liked movies, and I liked the indie movie world that I was mm -hmm. sort of playing with, and. Um, and so whether that's a good decision or not, who knows, but I, I, I went down that route and I said I'm going to try to pursue the movies that I, I like making and then I'm going to try to sell these spec scripts. I thought I'm a self-starter thanks to my theater training. I can just write original voiced, original idea screenplays yeah. and sell them in the spec market of LA. And that worked great for a couple of years. Yeah. And then this, I think I killed the spec market, <laughs> so, uh, you know, or the spec market uh, died. Well, you did well. Bit. You sold some play, uh, some, some screenplays, screen and that, I mean, that, again, that gives you a certain financial footing. Yeah, it was great. It was really great, and it gets you into the world of rewriting a little bit and right. uh, for hire. Uh, and I got so into that, in fact, 
one could say, I, I sort of missed out on the golden age of television at the beginning. You know? Right, because a bunch of those Drew Laird playwrights end up being showrunners for HBO, yeah. and yeah. Right? and I'm sure you know a lot of them. And, yeah. and, uh, and, and, that's, and that was great and th that they did it, and I, I just wasn't as drawn to television. I, sure. I, I liked movies, I grew up in movies, I, and I, I liked my, uh, my Arthur Miller plays, and yeah. I wanted to, to keep writing plays, and so I was very happy doing that for a long time. Um, and, it, and there's a price because those spec scripts never really got made. Right. Um, uh, one of them, the first one, actually was commissioned back to become a play, ironically, mm -hmm. afterwards, and I had a good run with that play, but it's... Uh, set in. Set in Rochester. Set in Rochester. Yes. <laughs> um, and it was, I don't know why I picked Rochester, I guess because you were up here. <laughs> and, uh, but I, I do think that um, uh, I, was, I was learning how to uh, also do these projects in Los Angeles and not just phone them in and not just think, oh, I can, uh, I can do this for fun and, and do my real work. I, I needed right. to actually bring the same amount of interest, uh, self -int uh, uh, of integrity and th sort of thought into these projects that mm -hmm. I was bringing into my plays and my ind independent film stuff. So that took me a while to figure out that. And I think that eventually led me to TV where, where it really landed. They wanted auteurs in the same way that right. I was chasing the independent film. They wanted writer-directors. Mm -hmm. um, and, and because even though you're not directing in TV, when you're the showrunner, you're, you're, you're micromanaging. Yeah, everything. You, you, yeah, it's your vision. And you're calling the shots, yeah. yeah. Right. Right. Um, so, and then, and then just to go on that point a little more, mm -hmm. is like, do you, does one try to staff, get a staffing job on Breaking Bad or the okay. West Wing or whatever, or do you try to um, create your own show? And stubbornly, I have tried to do that. So I've written a bunch of pilots that haven't gotten made, but I, I feel good about it because they're my idea, and, mm -hmm. I, and you, can, you can actually get paid for these selling sure. quite you know, well. And it it's, pays the bills, but you're not actually bills. getting the work produced. You don't, your IMDB page is not full. <laughs> and, and so I'm always like, because they don't show up on that. And, yeah. and, and so no one knows, they're like, where have you been? I've, I've been writing and selling, and, and you, they know you within the TV network within, world. Yeah. But uh, the movie guys forget about you, and right. so how do you keep alive in, in both is always a struggle. Right, and we've talked that before about the so most people don't really know probably who who writes the screenplay, right? right. I mean, that's not obviously right. the same as let alone actors, but even directors. Um, but just how challenging, and I'd imagine most people watching this don't know exactly how challenging it is to get a screenplay actually made. Yeah, can you talk a little bit about the realities of? Those those ten screenwriters who actually can get their movies made, and, and the rest of them are like, ah. Yeah, there there are so many. I mean, the the majority don't get made, and I and I wondered because when you're playing in the um in the studio system in in, mm -hmm. in Hollywood, where I've sold those specs, for example, those yeah. scripts, uh, you you get you get really great meetings, and you have really big people attached to your scri yeah. scripts for a long time. But they can just, they sort of die. The studio system is so massive. And the studio system, as we all know from the years I was writing, from 2005 to 15, was gravitating towards tentpole stuff right. and really winnowing away their, their, uh, their smaller, yeah, yeah, the yeah. focus features and all these places were just. Right. Um, and and uh, so that was frustrating. And that's kind of why I think I pivoted to, to attaching myself as a director and going the really indie route. Right. Um, yeah, which was a so that, which is management and, and so and management match. was something that I yeah. wrote really on, for, as a really small one and it happened to get uh, act, Jennifer Aniston attached and Woody Harrelson and yeah. it started to get this momentum and they spent a lot of money on that movie when they probably shouldn't have because it wasn't <laughs> c conceived that way right. and and it was at the tail end of Miramax and right. all these great right. big, yeah. and everyone's trying to. Uh, get in that market, and that was. But TV was taking over. It wasn't. It wasn't marketed probably appropriate to the film. It was. Yeah. Well, I. I would, that's on me because I think I wrote it as this dark, kind of weird, brooding thing about strange people on the fringes of society. Oh, and and <laughs> we ended up trying to shoot a romantic comedy uh, right. and have the best of both worlds. And so I was straddling several genres uh, mm -hmm. I, without without enough discipline, one, one might say. You, you were learning as you were doing it. I was learning as I was doing. And, yeah. and it was fun, and I own the movie. I, I, I own it in the sense like I'm, I'm proud of it, and yeah. I, I, uh, I like the fact that it jiffy pops into a different type of movie at a right, certain point. Right, it does. Yeah. Um, but I, uh, I, I also know that when people go to a Jennifer Aniston movie, they don't want to see her uh, do so, wearing a wig. They want to see her with, in, with her with, great with famous Rachel's, hair style. Yeah. Rachel. <laughs> and so when you put a wig on it, the first thing in the focus groups they'll ask you is, where's Chris, whatever her famous hairstylist guy yeah. was, because yeah. he, he wasn't on the film, because she had a wig. Mm -hmm. and, and to her credit, I'm just going to defend the movie for a second, to her she, credit, she, 
she wanted to go there. Yeah, and that was the in. first question I asked her. I was like, would you, cut, would you cut your hair into a crew cut for this? And she's like, no, I have another movie coming up, Marley and Me, but I will, uh, I will buy my own wig. And she found the most expensive and beautiful wig maker in London. She wanted to work on the project, and certainly yeah. she's done. She's, she's had a career where she will do these things as an actress, even while trying to negotiate. Yeah, her. it must be very challenging as a, yeah. a public figure at that level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. trying. To, I think for that entire cast uh, of, of friends, they've it's yes. been interesting. And they've all gone different ways in terms of reinventing themselves after that. But it is hard when you're that successful in, in one role for so long. Right, um, that's all you are. Yeah, in the public imagination. Yeah. I mean, even let's look at Brian Cranston on, on Breaking Bad. Sure. He's had more success in breaking out, and maybe that's because he's a man who knows what it is. Like, but even that, I think, he'll he'll never probably have a role as iconic as that, no, and as good. Um, and and he just happened. To, it was such a perfect fit. And and it's the same thing a little bit for writers. Like, and you see it in mm -hmm. Los Angeles a lot. You get to known as a type of writer, and you don't get approached with other projects. Uh, I, I, I feel like I got pigeonholed because yeah, of what, tape. What, okay, was, and so you're the... In ver theater, at least. Right, you're the ver verbose guy who does back and forth? Yeah, back and forth and is, is hyper-masculine okay. or macho writer. And I feel like I'm pretty sensitive and I, I write good female so. characters. Yes. And, I, <laughs> and But it's, I mean, I still have reviews we'll, 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 which will reference that play, which is a long time ago and an yes. early, early play of mine. By certain people in the New York Times? Is yes, right? yes, uh, <laughs> and who want, who, who want to put me in that and, and feel like it's a false move when I get out of that, mm -hmm. when, uh, when I think and naturally gravitate toward wanting to try a hundred different things and try and, and I feel like, um, well, I, I'm one thing, I feel like I, I can do other stuff. Yeah, <laughs> of course. So, so we talked a little bit about film and film world mm -hmm. and, and screenplay realities. Tell us a little more about theater, which is its own industry and its own challenges about actually getting a play produced. It's a great community to be in, and I think that's why I still live in New York, because I like that world, and I like the people I came supportive up with. Supportive. And supportive, but also it can be bitchy and, and, and tough. And I think um, uh, I had a good run for about 10 years. I was getting about a play almost almost every year, a new it's play. In, in, and which is really hard. <laughs> it's hard, and, it's, and I probably did it the dumb way, which was to premiere a lot of these things in New York, where you are up against the New York Times, and it's right. a make or break sure. for a very new play. Um, even that play match was uh, hadn't been any had any other productions and it went straight to Broadway and, right. and was sort of I was rewriting it as we, we were trying to open yeah and so um, I then I started experimenting sort of trying to go out of town first and, and that's been interesting but yeah. that has its own challenges but it, either way it's um, uh, what I feel like I do have is a network of actors that I can call and and some of them have gone on to become very very strong actors and and uh, they get what I'm going for, and I again that idea of cultivating people who get who you, you you have a simpatico with artistically, and um, I'm going to do a play this year in New York, mm -hmm. that at a very small venue, actually downtown kind mm -hmm. of, and I had it, it was a sort of a burden hand offer to do it versus sending it to the larger places, that might take a year and a half to to so actually just fit into a schedule. Yeah. And I, I, uh, I felt like, oh, I like this director, I like this, and I like the idea of coming in under the radar, and I like the idea of, of really owning the work and not having to uh, negotiate with the artistic director of a large corporate-backed right. off-Broadway theater. Right. Or, sure. And so I'm nervous about that, and I haven't had a play in a couple of years because I just haven't uh, been really working in, in theater that much. Right. And so, but I'm excited because it feels kind of getting back to 1998. Yeah, you know, yeah, exactly. Uh, where we, we can control it a little bit, and it's a, a, a very small three-hander play, and, mm -hmm. and uh, so. It feels like something pure to the art. It feels pure to the art, and. Less commercialized. The, very much so, and, yeah. and in, you know, just get, it's all about the acting, and it's mm -hmm. just about the, and, and it's funny because, just to be, go on about this for a second, the last play I tried to get in New York, I had all these readings uh, of, and I had these readings with Timothy Chalamet and Edie Falco playing a mother and son, and mm -hmm. I was like, I think this kid Timothy Chalamet is going to hit. He's going to do okay. Uh, we should, and, and people are like, I, I think the play maybe was too conventional. It was a little too Arthur Miller, and now mm -hmm. New York theater is looking for stuff that's a little bit more outside the box structurally and form sure. formally. Yep, yep. Um, and, uh, and so I couldn't get a production, and, and I was meeting with a TV executive for lunch, and he said, we're looking for uh, TV shows that are um, you know, about a woman and uh, that have a sense of mystery. I was like, well, that's really great. Uh, then I was like, well, I, I have this play. And I sent him the play, and it very quickly got read by everybody there. And mm -hmm. I sold it as, a, I, I didn't even have to pitch it. I sold, they bought it as a, 
10, potential 10 part series. And I, I was like, well, well, why is that? That's interesting. Mm -hmm. And um, because now TV is looking for those playwriting voices. And they said things like, because it was a very tight 90 minute structure that sure. led to yeah. this tragic Arthur Miller type ending kind of thing. And they said, if you want to spread it out to 10 hours, don't be afraid to take an entire hour long episode and have just two people talking. If you want to do that, do that. Yeah. And to have a TV executive say that to me right. That's was awesome. And, and uh, it's been the funnest thing I've been working on TV mm -hmm. wise because I feel like I can do, it's my baby, I can do anything I want. They like the source material. It's my source material, it's original. And, um, and they believe in it for the first time and I've never really had that in TV. It's always right. been. Right, so one of the things you're talking about is, is the way in which um, the television industry has changed because of uh, what's been afforded by these production outlets. So yeah. the ability to stream um, has led to so many more programs actually being produced because they Hulu needs content, Amazon yeah. needs content, yeah. right? And so it's, you know, what happened 25 years ago with the internet. This thing is there for people to so say, we need to build websites. How many and there so, are, I mean, that's how I mean, many shows it, there it, are. It, As a home consumer, I can't watch, like, I, there's too many things to watch. It's, 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 it's actually intimidating. But in yeah. one level, that's great for, for, for actors and for writers, because mm -hmm. they can actually get a lot of work in ways, you know, 25 years ago, they were still reliant on, on networks. On going through that whole yeah, gauntlet. Like, how yeah. do I guest star in NYPD Blue, and then that becomes maybe this on ER. And, yeah. right, and so Much less getting those. a show on is, uh, is really hard. Of course, that. and so now it's, 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 so it's changed that side, but one of the things I'm also hearing you say, because there's so many content options, they're more able to take artistic chances and, and sort of do commercial. They don't see it as the risk they would have wanted. Right, they want as. risk because they, it's how do you noticed. stand out, yeah. yeah. And it's, it, no, it's, it's really quite refreshing and, uh, and I mean, I think there's almost a glut now and there's so much to watch and, right. and so yeah, but the, the, a little bit the odder you are the, and mm -hmm. the, 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 risk, the more risk you, and, and it's, um, I mean, it, it'll, it'll be interesting just to see sort of how that plays out over time because, but what, what, I, what, I, what I think is also very interesting is that because of binge watching, you, yeah. you're, you are now watching a play. Yeah, you're, and exactly. And you can watch 10 hours in a row of, a, of an extravaganza 10 hour play or a 10 hour movie. Is, and Sean Penn will do a 10 hour right. episode, you know, series arc because he considers it a really long movie. And, and we're, we're approaching it that way as an audience. And that's, mm -hmm. that's obviously changing. And, that's changed a and, lot, right. And, and because you're not watching even week to week anymore, you can watch it all together. So tell us about some of the writers you contemporary writers you really are paying attention to who are influenced, who you, you're like, this person's doing really great work, um, f from your perspective as a writer, sure. in any of the genres you want to. Well, I, I'll start with theater. Annie Baker, is, mm -hmm. is, who's, who's won a Pulitzer, she's no, yeah. there's no secret about Annie Baker, but she has really um, changed uh, the way we watch theater a little bit in New York and, and elsewhere because she's willing to let it breathe, mm -hmm. e extremely amount. And she's written for, um, I think she's written TV for I Love, I Love Dick, Mm -hmm. That, that yep. show, uh, and Jill Sullivan. and I think her episode was is very famous because it's it's it breaks the form. It's almost direct address to the audience, and mm -hmm. no one sees that on TV. And right. she's willing to mess with form, and and it's not my cup of tea in terms of what I want to write necessarily. Like I, I I want people who are who are, are ver verbally uh, freaked out and ambitious and striving and failing, and and she's about sort of a, a this is a broad category. She's about people who don't know what they want. Mm -hmm. And the and the and this existential breach that happens when they're sure. together. I yeah. want people who are juxtaposed and, and are trying to figure out how to get along and, mm -hmm. and survive in the world and have great confrontation and mm -hmm. and have to and have to figure it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, but she's she's very influential and I and I quite admire what she's up to. I'm a big fan of Stephen Adley Girgis, who mm -hmm. is um uh, and has been for a long time writing. Again, he's putting people, different people, on stage together and seeing what happens for right. lack of a better. And I and I and he's got verbal pyrotechnics that are yeah. fun to watch, and he's just hilarious. I find his sense of humor mm -hmm. uh, hugely soulful and heart 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 heavy, yeah. but but with a with a comic flair that sure. I, is almost unmatched. Playfulness, yeah. Yeah, um, uh, and in, in television, um, you know, obviously, I came up on uh, David Simon was the, for a lot of us sure. playwrights a, a big. Um, influence and and that mix of uh, of social interest that he has, he's just curious you know, mm -hmm. on a socio economic social dynamic level and he is able to create uh, mosaics which is not to say everything needs to be an ensemble piece um, 
because I think there is a propulsive, if you take the wire, there's a propulsive central core, for better but or worse. A panorama. Yeah. Right. And you get, yeah, exactly, you're getting a huge shot, snapshot, but an evolving snapshot of the community. Yeah, he, I mean, he's a, he was a he's journalist. He's a journalist, yeah. 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 And so that's just, that's, that's exciting to me, and I think, obviously, we like watching that because we see ourselves in that, mm -hmm. and we recognize who we are a little bit. Um, is that the, the Facebook game of which character from The Wire you are? <laughs> oh, is there? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, there was. I don't think. I mean, it's, it, that interests me a little bit more than Breaking Bad. I have to say, Breaking Bad, I feel like was great because you're watching this one person's weird evolution and de-evolution. Right. And but it, I, I felt that even that show had to um, be gratuitously violent sometimes, and it just in order to titillate and to keep its viewership. It wasn't doubling down on what David Simon doubles down, which was human beings. Right, that there is a certain performativity in Breaking Bad about character and situation that we're, we're just gonna ramp it up, um, right, turn it to 11, as it were, yeah. um, constantly. So that each character, an actor, an actress, gets to, to really shine do and do crazy. stuff great. Yeah. Um, but that what, what, what I'm hearing you say is that what's going on in these David Simon dramas uh, feels more true to what people are, are like and have yeah. lived. And, and that's just a personal taste. I get the need to be, to be mesmerized by crazy crap happening on right. TV. Like, it's great and it's fun. Um, and, and I was referencing the, this thing, uh, it's a new, I think it's BBC, called Bodyguard, mm. which is apparently a big hit in there and it's starting to be a big hit here. And it's very political and it's about today and, and I love yeah. that. But it, there's so much violence and, and huge set piece right. action in, that I'm like, it stretches the boundaries of credulity a little bit and, mm -hmm. I, and I'm sort of, uh, I want them to pull it back a little bit, keep us interested, keep the explosions happening when they need to, but yeah. earn them and make right, sure right, they're right. justified. Right. And, and I, I am very aware when they are thrown in for the sake of titillation versus earned. Right. Uh, dramaturgically. Dramaturgically. I had to get that word in there. <laughs> yeah. um, and I think, but yeah, so, um, but there's so much on, on TV now that's amazing. It's, I, it's, it's, it's too much. I, like, I, I haven't even seen the Bill Hader show on, on mm -hmm. HBO, but I, I can guess that I like what he's doing because he's playing with um, he's playing with a genre of like the hitman drama, but he's doing an inner uh, character search of a guy who wants to be an actor, if I'm not yeah, mistaken. Yeah. And, um, and he's doing comedy, and he apparently saps into drama, and I like the, the straddling of those things a lot. Right. If well, he that's can pull your that off. That a lot. Some, yeah. Some of them, I mean, he's totally, he's really pushing it, it sounds like, but pulling it off in a right. good way. Um, and that feels like something I would watch, because I, I need my quotient of humanity but I also like so a little Atlanta too. D Donald yeah, work, amazing, right? amazing what he's up to. I mean, because that's doing that same thing where you're all of a sudden like, wait, is this a, again, this is a comedy? I guess right. But it's also clearly not. Yeah, <laughs> and he's writing from his gut and he's mm -hmm. acting from his gut, and so the tour de forceness of it alone is amazing. Right. But um, the fact that he is uh, he's willing to go wherever his mind is going, but we never lose touch with him because it's him and we know that he is an artist, he is a character, he is a writer, is, is following his gut and you right. kind of get that and so that gut can go to comedy, it can go to weird surrealness, it can go to yeah. and you're with him because you, you trust him as, mm -hmm. a, as a performer and a writer and, a, right. and that's, kinda, that's interesting stuff. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's interesting that the, that the weird has become this category that's a very, very uh, successful. Yeah. Right, commercially. And I think you're gonna find a lot of imitators who are gonna yes. screw that up. Yeah, oh yeah. And, and they're gonna get a lot of airtime because of it, and, and that sounds like sour grapes, but I, 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 I think, you no. know, there's still, you know, you can still have room for it all, but it has to be really done well. It has to be, yeah, and, and to use it has to be honest, it has to be true yeah. in some way. Um, and, and he, if I understand, I mean, he was, what is he, the youngest writer on 30 Rock or something? Yeah. Like, he's, so, yeah. He's, he's figured out something about how he wants to approach his, his art. His own work. And he's yeah. done that homework and he's done that self-research right, or you know, self-exploration as an artist to get to the point where he's able to produce something that so, mm -hmm. has so much bravura, I guess. Yeah. yeah. So tell us what's coming up for you. What, what things are you working on now? Uh, you said you have a play coming out in the, in the next year or so? Yeah, or I have a play. Uh, the, the play I'm proud, uh, is, I'm proud of because I, my wife told me I should go to therapy again. And, <laughs> and, uh, well, you live in New York. I, I live in New York. And, <laughs> but she said, she suggested on two, she said you should go to therapy because you need it and, and you should also <laughs> do it as research as a writer because and, and this has been a, a, a struggle with me forever it was like how do you write the personal while well, I, I mentioned in the yeah. beginning with Placing a, it in, the social in the social context so I went back and I thought about my mother and I did some 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 some, some, some work as they say I did some work early right. on and I decided that I was going to write this play about a woman's life from A to Z 
and, um, and I was going to take the most important moments of her life in a non-chronological way and just put them out there and see what they added up to. Right. And it feels good, for, it was a really good exercise for me because it feels honest and it feels like I imbued half of my own important stuff into what I thought was hers, mm -hmm. into Charlie Coco, people I've known over, over this course of, of my life, mm -hmm. and I just sort of said, I want vitality on stage and, right. and, and in a, in a bare-boned way, and that, that feels right. So I'm hoping that, that goes well. I'm working on a movie that I want to direct mm -hmm. uh, that, that takes place in Brooklyn where I live, and it's sort of not about gentrification, but again, about people running up against each other who wouldn't normally. And I've you know, right. created situations where they organically run up and against each other. And that's kind of what you moved into, right? Yeah. When you, when you, when you moved to Brooklyn. Yeah, you know, I like moved to Brooklyn. Like undergoing great change. Yeah. And you still see it because there are these different communities that are clashed up against each other. And, and that are changing at the time and that have the long history of, of being a particular type of neighborhood and then all of a sudden. And it's not as rosy, and Brooklyn is not as rosy as it, it gets credited for. And it's, right. there's a lot going on underneath the surface I yes. wanted to get yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. So if I could pull that off, that would be my number one project coming up. Um, okay. And then, and then, and because you know this is what you, you do, you you have things that are going also. So you have I'm writing a couple pilots, the one I mentioned, and another mm -hmm. one about the opioid crisis. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I'm you know you pitch uh, you, then you, you pitch a movie if you have it, if someone uh, sends you a book or an article and you get jazzed by it and you feel oh I should try to make room for this. Um, right. There's a Vanity uh, Fair article. Um, about a guy who went off and joined the fight against ISIS over in Syria. Okay. He was a kind of a slacker dude in California, and he, it's the YPG, which I can't remember what it stands for in English, but it's, they're the, um, this coalition of mostly Kurds fighting uh, and, and backed by U.S. Army intelligence sure. to fight against um, ISIS. And this guy went over and joined, and he kept a, uh, uh, he had a tw Twitter account, he was fe doing feeds, and it became kind of this weird. So Jake Gyllenhaal has optioned this story, okay, yeah. and they were looking for a writer, and so I, I, this is what, just to let, you know, what, how you, how, I heard about this, and I had a meeting with them, and they told me about this, and there's a director who had brought them this, and so I was like, can I try to pitch on it? They weren't willing to give me the job right off, uh, but uh, I was one of a couple writers that are having a chance to pitch it, so I pitched that, and, so, like, if if uh, if my movie doesn't go, and I were to get that job, that was what that would what I would be doing next. Yeah. You know, th those kinds of. But you never know. And it's so a lot of juggling. It's a lot of juggling, and, and but you have to and you have to let it go. You have to do all you can to pitch it without spending twenty weeks on it. You, you spend you know a week on developing a pitch for free, yeah. knowing you get paid if they accept it, and that you do the odds. You're like, are there, are there five writers going for it, or am I one of three, and am I the you know the first in line, mm -hmm. and and do I have work in, the, in my past that supports their, why they might want to hire me, that right. justifies that? So it's, it's all a, that It's calculus. a business meeting, yeah. as much as anything oh, else. Oh, it totally is. And yet, you want to, and yet it's all under this guise of congenial, hey, artistic fellowship. Right. And you know, it's like, not really. No, I, I'm one more commodity that you are going to either reject or accept <laughs> by the end of the day. And yet, they tell me, like, you rush and do this thing. You, you go up there and you make this pitch. And, and they're like, yeah, we're going to hear pitches over the next couple of months, probably. <laughs> like really, uh, and then do you force their hand, and they are they being manipulative of you, and you don't know, and you try to suss it out. So you, and you try not to lose your your calm about yeah, that your, stuff. Yeah, your negotiations of your emotions in this must be yeah. really challenging. that's that's a big thing, and, and hence the therapy. Hence the therapy, <laughs> like to not take it personally. Right. To know that that is a, it is a marketplace of ideas, and the mm -hmm. best ideas will, will be the one they sign, or the not even not whoever's even friends with Jake Gyllenhaal will get the job. <laughs> you know, half of it uh, yeah. at that time. So. But I, I have learned to train myself to, um, to give it all I got and then let it go. And if it comes, and, and the actors do this constantly. They I'm audition sure. 40 times a day and, and they don't often hear for you know, weeks. Right. And so uh, it's, it, there are worse ways to go, I guess. But. So long term, what, what are your hopes? What do you, what do you want to? Uh, I, I'm really attracted to this directing idea. I'm not a born director. I never aspired to it until, until I did. You're still learning cameras. I, I don't know lenses particularly well, <laughs> but I love the, the, the fact that I can't blame anyone else. Yeah. Um, even in theater, you can blame the actor or the director. Here, uh, if you're a writer or a director, you got to own it. You, you're going to cast it. You're going you're gonna, to uh, cultivate that performance. You're going to edit the hell out of it. Um, you're going to choose the music. You're gonna, I mean, every, right. everything is yours. So for a person who doesn't necessarily uh, proactivate a lot and likes to sit in his room and write, Going out there and forcing myself to make those decisions and own them, right, 
and understand what I want to be as an artist and what, or what I want to say, you know, like with this movie, mm -hmm. that's huge. And um, so even though I don't think I would want to do it full time, like I want to keep doing that over the next couple, I want to make four more movies, let's say, five more movies would be okay. good. Uh, but I need a little momentum. I can't just make one and wait five years and then try and Yeah, well, it mm -hmm. seems like the, the industry is, is you need to get one produced. That, yeah. And that, in theory, and, and it needs to hit. And, and it has to do well enough to get you another Yeah, it has to make some money. I yeah. haven't done that quite that yet. I will be the first to admit. Uh, and then I, 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 I do want to keep writing plays. I'm, I'm working on a, um, a play that uh, I've, that's taken me longer than anything I've ever written. I, some, to my own fault, I sometimes just write very quickly. Right. And the play comes out, and it's great, and then I rewrite it. But this one is actually a three-act kind of epic odyssey of over 30 years of a brother and a sister over, time, over the first 30 years of this century. So it goes into the future a little bit. Okay. And um, it, they interact with history, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, it's hopefully subtly. And, uh, and I just sort of finished a draft of it finally. And it, it, was, it was originally a two-act play about one protagonist, a male protagonist. Now it's a three-act play about three different protagonists. Mm -hmm. And each act is structured differently, different form. And, and from a POV of a different character who are right. all related. And um, so I don't know what to do with that uh, other than maybe slowly bring it out into the world and try and re have some, yeah, have some people come and, in and, and, yeah, hear and, it. And, and hear it, yeah, yeah. It's awfully verbose. And <laughs> it's a long one. It's a long one, but it's great because I've always wanted to write an epic play sure, and yeah. tape was like the antithesis of that where I started to write these little tiny yeah, tight yeah. taut plays and I, and I want to let it breathe now. I want to breathe. Uh, right, well, you, when you were really starting out there in the 90s, we had a lot of those sorts of big, big shows. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, this one is uh, aiming to be, yeah. But it's, it's amazing. Like, you, you still, I'm going, does anyone want to hear from me and my point of view in the first 30 years of the American? But, it, but if I can keep it personal, I can keep it based on things yeah. that, are, that feel vital. Personal but situated in a time and place. Yeah. That and history. That will be recognizable. That will be recognizable. So if he brushes up against this or she brushes up against this moment that we can all recognize, we'll understand we're going through a, a, a social perspective look at, or you know, a look at uh, our, our, our society while watching a personal story. Right. Right. That would be the trick. Right, we'll, look, we'll look forward to that. Yeah, I'm sure you will. So uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having and, me. And uh, it's been our pleasure. Um, again, my name is Steve Brower. I'm an associate professor of English here at St. John Fisher. And uh, Stephen Belber is a clearly a very active playwright, screenwriter, television writer. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, no, it's terrific. And uh, thanks for joining us. And uh, look forward to uh, giving you another interview soon.